name in the temple or in this really kadosh or holy environment because it, it, it's defiled by being on our lips. It's like, if it's good enough for Boaz, well, he was a nobleman. If it's good enough for his workers in the field, it certainly should be good enough for us. That's a qualification. It's a disclaimer for, but if other people don't want to use it, that's up to them. You go to Exodus 20, I think it's verse 21. It's at the end of the Ten Commandments, right after he states the Ten Commandments, and he says, in all places where I, and then it's inferred, allow or permit, where is Azakir, my name to be remembered or mentioned, there I will come to you and bless you. So I propose that the Hebrew alphabet is actually the Shem of Yahweh. In all places I allow my Shem to be remembered, there I will come to you and bless you. So I'm, I, I go off the assumption or the, the hope or the confidence that because we're talking about his Shem today, that he will show up here and bless us. Even so, Yahweh, make, make it so. Please come here and bless us. The point is, in Leviticus 26, four times he says to Israel, if you forsake my covenant, then seven times like your sins, or seven ways like your sins, I will multiply the curse or the punishment upon you. And then he gives a list of what's going to happen. And he says, and then, essentially, I will present before you my covenant again. And if you still resist it, profane it, defile it, I'll multiply it seven times more. And if you still resist it, seven times, he says that four times. Well, interesting enough, in Hebrew, the word seven is shin bet ayin, which also means to swear an oath. Or it's the, the curse upon you because of the obligation of the oath that you failed to live up to. So when you say swear in a stack of Bibles, why would you need any more than one Bible? But how many Bibles is a stack of? Two or three or seven? If you, if you swear by seven, that's like, you're in big trouble now, as if you know you could swear on one Bible and you have away with it or something. But the point is, when a Jewish bride walks around her husband in the wedding ceremony seven times, what's she doing? She's swearing an oath of seven. Seven is an oath. So people say, well, seven is the heavenly number. Not necessarily. Every letter has its own regard equal to all the other ones, but they all mean something. But the letter Zion is the seventh letter, and it's a weapon, and it means that which cuts off. So you can say, well, a weapon, that's, that's a pretty severe thing. Well, it's like, yes, the weapon will protect you, but it'll also hurt you if it's coming against you. So the curse will hurt you, but the blessing you get for keeping the oath will, will bless you. So there's these different ways of seeing everything according to the letters. There's seven festivals. If we go around the year keeping the seven festivals, we're walking in this circle of a sworn oath, vowing our lives of allegiance and fidelity to Yahweh as we keep the festivals, the seven festivals. When you keep the Sabbath day, every seventh day, when you keep the Shemitah here in the Jubilee, the Yovel, you're swearing an oath of allegiance to Yahweh. But see, if you don't know the language of Hebrew, you miss that whole connection. It's just gone. In Ezekiel chapter 4, Ezekiel is told to lay it aside 40 days for the house of Yehuda, the son of the kingdom, 390 days for the northern kingdom, the house of Ephraim or Israel. And you go, okay, so what? Well, Israel was taken in captivity. Did anybody read the Harbinger? Yes. Okay. That's in Isaiah. Depending on, I, I use Stone's Tanakh, Stone's Edition, Art Scroll. The reason is, easy on my eyes. I like the format of how they put it. JPS has a different English translation, but I don't trust this English translation. I don't trust the JPS translation. I don't trust KJV or NIV or any of the other ones. And the reason I don't trust them is because I've been trying to learn how to read Hebrew and I think, see things don't match up. I'm not condemning them or criticizing them. It's just I don't trust them. I don't like them, so I've been working on my own translation, which I would like to be able to show you how to do simply by knowing what the letters mean. There's different ways you can work on a translation, but if you don't know what the letters mean, you can't do anything. So all I'm saying is that I'm not saying, boy, this is the greatest translation, but it makes it easy to see these words. Um, so, I almost lost where I was there. Ezekiel chapter 4. So Ezekiel chapter 4 says, 40 days lay on your side for the southern kingdom. So Daniel, um, 
Then Assyria, okay, go back to the harbinger, that's what it was. The harbinger is in Isaiah 9.10 or Isaiah 9.8. I use this, it's Isaiah 9.9. 9. Other people say it's, well, it's Isaiah 9.10. What I was trying to say is that the numbers sometimes are shifted. The chapters and verses are shifted, and so you don't always get the correlation. If you read in chapter 8 of Isaiah, it talks about Israel spinning off away from the covenant and doing all these nasty things that Yahweh doesn't really appreciate. And so he says he's going to stir up their enemies. And so Assyria started coming in and doing these little raids and attacks. And it says in verse 9 there that, that they said, hey, you guys knocked down the bricks, we're going to rebuild with stone. You guys knocked down the sycamore tree, we're going to rebuild with cedars. At 9-11, Senator and Congressman and Mayor Giuliani and President Obama and all these other people, I don't know, it was Bush and maybe Obama oh, also quoted yeah. But during the rebuilding, Obama, I think, quoted it. The point is, for many years, we, they've been quoting this verse as if, this is what we're going to do. And then this guy that wrote the Harbinger book, this, this Rabbi uh, Khan, yeah. Khan or something. Jonathan Khan. Jonathan Khan. Something inspired him to look this up, and what he found was, to a T, every single thing that was talked about is what we're doing, but what our, our great leaders, our fearless leaders, didn't tell us was that when they quoted that verse, it wasn't a good thing. Y'all was saying, in your haughtiness and your arrogance, you guys say this instead of turning around and considering the hand of the one who struck you, which, yes, yeah, it was arrogant. No, it wasn't them, it was Yahweh himself. And he says, I have stirred up the enemies of Rezin, the king of Israel, and I will strengthen her adversaries. And it's like, so Khan was writing this and saying, hey, listen, if we don't recognize what this is about, we could fall the same fate. Well, there was a 13-year siege of, a, of Assyria on the northern kingdom of Israel. And from my understanding of history, they finally accomplished taking over Samaria with a final military assault. They took it all over in 721. Some people say 722, but it's, you know, where's, where do you start the year and different calendars and stuff, but basically 721 BC. About 130 years or so later, the southern kingdom got taken over by Babylon. Well, the, Babylon was a general Assyrian who rebelled and took over Assyria and made the king of Babylon. So they're kind of the same people group around the area of Iran and Iraq, that, that general area. But anyway, Daniel got taken in captivity from the southern kingdom, and he's sitting there reading the books in the library of what happened. And he says, well, this has been 40 years, and there, there may be something else going on, but Jeremiah said it would be 70 years. And he said, it's been 70 years. 70 years was a legal punishment that we got kicked out of the land, the land ruined, and uh, we've been in captivity. Hey, we should get to go home. So he prayed to Yahweh and confessed the sins of his fathers and the sins of his people and his own personal... And Yahweh sent the Melach, the angel, the messenger to him and said, you're right, you guys get to go back home. So they get to go back home. But what about the northern king? They went into captivity 150 years before. They've never come back. But if that was only 390 years, and from 721, say it's 400 years, that would put it to, uh, what, 321? That's around the times of uh, Alexander. Alexander the Great, the Macedonian, who swept through and conquered that. Uh, why didn't Israel get to come back then? Because they didn't repent during that window, so I thought it returned sevenfold. Well, that's the point. If Israel never repented, and then Yahweh gave them another 390 year, did he give them four 390 year windows? And because Israel, the northern king, the ten tribes, just said, ah, we like it out here, we don't like it out here. Right. He multiplied it seven times? Well, the seven times, if he's going to live up to his threat in Leviticus 26, seven times 390 is 2,730. From 721 BC, there's no year zero, so it goes 1 BC to 1 AD, it turns out to be 2010 AD. So, for some reason, anybody before the year 2010, anything they tried to figure out about the covenant and coming back would have been in some kind of a, an imprisoned confine that we don't necessarily even know how to define. But Yahweh himself said, you're under this curse. Now, was it simply a curse of dispersion? Or was there a curse of confusion and blindness and ignorance too? Well, that's the end of the curse in 2010. So a few of us went to Israel in, in 2010 at Sukkot, and that was a pretty significant event. 
I think it was a significant event because that's the in gathering harvest. The day of Shemini Yatzeret, we actually found ourselves up in Shiloh, which is where the Mishkan stood. But they profaned it. The Philistines, remember, they took the Ark of the Covenant and ran off. They, I don't know if they burned down or whatever they did in the Mishkan, but it wasn't there. And so we were back there. We were there that, that day, and we had to leave in a big hurry. There was four of us, and all of a sudden, it's like we all felt this compulsion to go over to the place where the Ark of the uh, Altar of Incense stood, you know, the place of the prayers. And they actually offer up this prayer that was like this spontaneous thing that was actually very similar to what Daniel said for the southern kingdom. And it's like, did that actually do something that has some effect? The end of the 2007 30 year curse? Representatives from Ephraim standing on the site, the very spot where the altar of incense would have stood, which is now just a pile of rocks, but you can see the outline of where the Mishkan would be, and maybe. It's like, gee, what a privilege to be one of those four of it. It's like, we didn't plan that. But it was a real event. It really was a real event. You could, you could feel it. Well, so what about this other? I am down at I am tall. Does anybody know what that says? What that spells? The, in Daniel 12, 4. So I mentioned that, and somebody mentioned that they were recognized, right? Hide the words in Silver Book, in Paleo, it's I am Dalit, I am Toph. Until the time. The next word is the end. Until the time of the end. You guys are familiar with this uh, passage? Yeah. This is the last chapter of the book of Daniel. At the end of his life, pretty much, Angel Gabriel shows up. What do you think is Gabriel? You look back at chapter 9 or chapter 10, and Gabriel's talking to him, and then it just says, this one was talking to him. Well, it might have been Gabriel, it might not, but, but the point is, it might have been Gabriel. And he says, Daniel, hide the words and seal the book until the time of the end. For many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. You've heard this voice, verse? Yeah. Okay. Hide the words and seal the book until the time of the end. I've heard my whole life since I was a kid, this is the time of the end. The proof is, even now, knowledge has increased. We've got computers, we've got spaceships, we've got... Okay, we should have the words unhidden and unsealed. Which words did he hide and which book did he seal? Does everybody know? 